Chapter 6 Announcement of Future Destiny After pronouncing these stanzas, the Lord addressed the complete assembly of monks. I announce to you, monks, I make known to you that the monk Kasyapa, my disciple here present, shall do homage to 30,000 Kotis of Buddhas, shall respect, honor, and worship them, and shall keep the true law of those lords and Buddhas. In his last bodily existence in the world, of Vabhasa, in the age, Maha Vyuha, i.e. great division, he shall be a Tathagata, an Arhat, by the name of Rasmi Prabhasa, his lifetime shall last twelve intermediate kalpas, and his true law twenty intermediate kalpas. The counterfeit of his true law shall last as many intermediate kalpas. His Buddha field will be pure, clean, devoid of stones, grit, gravel, of pits and precipices, devoid of gutters and dirty pools, even pretty beautiful and pleasant to see, consisting of lapis lazuli, adorned with jewel trees and looking like a checkerboard with eight compartments set off with gold threads. It will be strewed with flowers, and many hundred thousand bodhisattvas are to appear in it. As to disciples, there will be innumerable hundred thousands of myriads of kotis of them. Neither Mara, the evil one, nor his host will be discoverable in it, though Mara and his followers shall afterwards be there. For they will apply themselves to receive the true law under the command of that very Lord, Rasmi Prabhasa. And on that occasion, the Lord uttered the following stanzas. Stanza 1. With my Buddha eye, monks, I see that the Senior Kasyapa here shall become a Buddha at a future epoch, in an incalculable aeon, after he shall have paid homage to the Most High of Men. This Kasyapa shall see fully thirty thousand Kotis of Ginas, under whom he shall lead a spiritual life for the sake of Buddha knowledge. Stanza 3. After having paid homage to those highest of men and acquired that supreme knowledge, he shall in his last bodily existence be a lord of the world, a matchless great seer. And his field will be magnificent, excellent, pure, goodly, beautiful, pretty, nice, ever delightful, and set off with gold threads. That field, monks, appearing like a board divided into eight compartments. We'll have several jewel trees, one in each compartment from which issues a delicious odor. It will be adorned with plenty of flowers and embellished with variegated blossoms. In it are no pits nor precipices. It is even goodly beautiful. There will be found hundreds of kotis of bodhisattvas subdued of mind and of great magical power. Mighty keepers of sutrantas of great extension. As to disciples, faultless princes of the law, standing in their last period of life, their number can never be known even if one should go on counting for aeons, and that with the aid of divine knowledge. He himself shall stay twelve intermediate kalpas, and his true law twenty complete aeons. The counterfeit is to continue as many aeons in the domain of Rasmi Prabhasa. Thereupon the venerable senior Maha Maudga Lilyana the Venerable Subhuti and the Venerable Maha Katyayana, 
Their bodies trembling gazed up to the Lord with unblenching eyes, and at the same moment severally uttered in mental concert the following stanzas. Stanza 10. O hallowed one, great hero, Arhat, Sakyalion, most high of men, out of compassion to us speak the Buddha word. Stanza 11. The highest of men, the Gina, he who knows the fatal term, will, as it were, sprinkle us with nectar by predicting our destiny also. It is as if a certain man in time of famine comes and gets good food, but to whom, when the food is already in his hands, they say that he should wait. Similarly, it was with us who, after minding the lower vehicle, at the calamitous conjuncture of a bad time, were longing for Buddha knowledge. But the perfectly enlightened great seer has not yet favored us with a prediction of our destiny as if he would say, do not eat the food that has been put into your hand. Quite so, O hero. We were longing as we heard the exalted voice and thought, then shall we be at rest when we shall have received a prediction. Utter a prediction, O great hero, so benevolent and merciful. Let there be an end of our feeling of poverty. And the Lord, who in his mind apprehended the thoughts arising in the minds of those great senior disciples, again addressed a complete assembly of monks. This great disciple of mine, monks, the senior Subuti, shall likewise pay homage to thirty hundred thousand myriads of Kotis of Buddhas, shall show them respect, honor, reverence, veneration, and worship. Under them shall he lead a spiritual life and achieve enlightenment. After the performance of such duties shall he, in his last bodily existence, become a Tathagata in the world, an Arhat, by the name of Sashiketu. His Buddha filled will be called Ratnasambhava and his epoch Ratnaprabhasa. And that Buddha filled will be even beautiful crystalline variegated with jewel trees devoid of pits and precipices devoid of sewers nice covered with flowers. And there will men have their abode in palaces or towers given them for their use and it will be many disciples innumerable so that it would be impossible to terminate the calculation many hundred thousand myriads of kotis of bodhisattvas also will be there the lifetime of that lord is to last 12 intermediate kalpas his true law is to continue 20 intermediate kalpas and its counterfeit as many that Lord will, while standing poised in the firmament, preach the law to the monks and educate many thousands of bodhisattvas and disciples. And on that occasion, the Lord uttered the following stanzas. I have something to announce, monks, something to make known. Listen then to me, the senior Subhuti, my disciple. Shall in days to come be a Buddha. Stanza 18. After having seen of most mighty Buddhas, thirty myriads of Kotis in full, he shall enter upon the straight course to obtain this knowledge. In his last bodily existence shall the hero, possessed of the thirty-two distinctive signs, become a great seer similar to a column of gold, beneficial and bounteous to the world. Stanza 20. The field where that friend of the world shall save myriads of coatees of living beings will be most beautiful, pretty, and delightful to people at large. 21. In it will be many bodhisattvas to turn the wheel that never rolls back. Endowed with keen faculties they will under that gina. be the ornaments of the Buddha field. His disciples are so numerous as to pass calculation and measure, gifted with the six transcendent faculties, the triple science and magic power, firm in the eight emancipations. His magic power, while he reveals supreme enlightenment, is inconceivable. Gods and men, as numerous as the sands of the Ganges, will always reverentially salute him with joined hands. 
He shall say twelve intermediate kalpas, the true law of that most high of men is to last twenty intermediate kalpas, and the counterfeit of it as many. Again, the Lord addressed the complete assembly of monks. I announce to you, monks, I make known that the senior Maha Katyayana, here present, my disciple, shall pay homage to eight thousand kotis of Buddhas, shall show them respect, honor, reverence, veneration, and worship. At the expiration of those Tathagatas, he shall build stupas. A thousand yoganas in height, fifty yoganas in circumference, and consisting of seven precious substances to wit, gold, silver, lapis lazuli, crystal, red pearl, emerald, and seventhly coral. Those stupas he shall worship with flowers, incense, perfumed wreaths, ointments, powder, robes, umbrellas, banners, flags, triumphal streamers. Afterwards, he shall again pay similar homage to twenty kotis of Buddhists, show them respect, honor, reverence, veneration, and worship. Then in his last bodily existence, his last corporeal appearance, he shall be a Tathagata in the world, an Arhat, and so forth, named Gambunada, Prabhasa, i.e. gold shine, endowed with science and conduct. His Buddha field will be thoroughly pure, even, nice, pretty, beautiful, crystalline, variegated with jewel trees, interlaced with gold threads, strewed with flowers, free from beings of the brute creation, hell, and the host of demons, replete with numerous men and gods, adorned with many hundred thousand disciples and many hundred thousand bodhisattvas. The measure of his lifetime shall be twelve intermediate kalpas. His true law shall continue twenty intermediate kalpas and its counterfeit as many. And on that occasion the Lord uttered the following stanzas, 25. Listen all to me, ye monks, since I am going to utter an infallible word. Katya Yanana. Katya Yana here. The senior, my disciple, shall render worship to the leaders. He shall show veneration of various kinds and in many ways to the leaders, after whose expiration he shall build stupas, worshipping them with flowers and perfumes. In his last bodily existence he shall be a gina, in a thoroughly pure field, and after acquiring full knowledge he shall preach to a thousand kotis of living beings. He shall be a mighty Buddha and illuminator, highly honored in this world, including the gods, under the name of Gambunada. Prabhasa, and save kotis of gods and men, many bodhisattvas, as well as disciples beyond measure and calculation, will in that field adorn the reign of that Buddha, all of them freed from existence and exempt from existence. Again, the Lord addressed a complete assembly of monks. I announce to you, monks, I make known that the senior, Maha, Maud, Gal, Yayana, here present, my disciple shall propitiate twenty eight thousand Buddhas and pay those lords homage of various kinds. He shall show them respect and, after their expiration, build stupas consisting of seven precious substances to wit, gold, silver, lapis lazuli, crystal, red pearl, emerald, and seventhly coral, stupas, a thousand yoganas in height, and five hundred. Yoganas in circumference, which stupas he shall worship in different ways with flowers, incense, perfumed wreaths, ointments, powder, robes, umbrellas, banners, flags, and triumphal streamers. Afterwards, he shall again pay a similar worship to twenty hundred thousand kotis of Buddhas. He shall show respect, and in his last bodily existence become in the world a Tathagata named Tama, Vapatra, Kandana, Ganda, endowed with science and conduct. The field of that Buddha will be called Mano Birama, his period Rati Prati Purna. And that Buddha field will be even nice, pretty, beautiful, crystalline, variegated with jewel trees, strewn with detached flowers, replete with gods and men, frequented by hundred thousands of seers, that is to say, disciples and bodhisattvas. The measure of his lifetime shall be twenty-four intermediate kalpas. His true law is to last forty intermediate kalpas and its counterfeit as many. And on that occasion the Lord uttered the following stanzas. 
30, the scion of the Mudgala race, my disciple here after leaving human existence, shall see 20,000 mighty Ginas and 8,000 more of these faultless beings. Under them he shall follow a course of duty trying to reach Buddha knowledge. He shall pay homage in various ways to those leaders and to the most high of men after keeping their true law of wide reach and sublime for thousands of kotis of aeons. He shall at the expiration of those sugatas worship their stupas. 33. In honor of those most high genas, those mighty beings so beneficial to the world, he shall erect stupas consisting of precious substances and decorated with triumphal streamers, worshipping them with flowers, perfumes, and the sounds of music. At the period of his last bodily existence, he shall, in a nice and beautiful field, be a Buddha bounteous and compassionate to the world under the name of Tama La Patra Kandan Aganda. The measure of that Sugata's life shall be fully 24 intermediate kalpas, during which he shall be assiduous, in declaring the Buddha rule to men and gods. That Gina shall have many thousands of kotis of disciples innumerable as the sands of the Ganges, gifted with the six transcendent faculties in the triple science and possessed of magic power under the command of that Sugata. Under the reign of that Sugata, there shall also appear numerous bodhisattvas, many thousands of them unable to slide back or to deviate, developing zeal. Of extensive knowledge and studious habits. After that Gina's expiration, his true law shall measure in time twenty-four intermediate kalpas in full. Its counterfeit shall have the same measure. These are my five mighty disciples, whom I have destined to supreme enlightenment and to become in future self-born Gina's. Now hear from me their course. Chapter 7. Ancient Devotion of Your Monks in the Past Incalculable, More Than Incalculable, Inconceivable, Immense, Measureless Aeon, Since, Nay, at a Period, An Epoch Far Beyond, There Appeared in the World, A Tathagata, Named Maha Bhikina Gna Anabibu, Endowed with Science and Conduct, A Sugata, In the Sphere Sambhavha, origin genesis in the period maharupa you ask monks how long ago is it that the tathagata was born well suppose some man was to reduce to powder the whole mass of the earth element as much as is to be found in this whole universe that after taking one atom of dust from this world he is to walk a thousand worlds farther in easterly direction to deposit that single atom that after taking a second atom of dust and walking a thousand worlds farther he deposits that second atom and proceeding in this way at last gets the whole of the earth element deposited in eastern direction now monks what do you think of it is it possible by calculation to find the end or limit of these worlds they answered, Certainly not, Lord, certainly not, Sugata. The Lord said, On the contrary, monks, some arithmetician or master of arithmetic might indeed be able by calculation to find the end or limit of the worlds. Both of those were where the atoms have been deposited and where they have not. But it is impossible by applying the rules of arithmetic to find the limit of those hundred thousands of myriads of aeons so long so inconceivable so immense is the number of aeons which have elapsed since the expiration of that lord the tathagata maha bhigna gna ana bibu yet monks i perfectly remember that tathagata who has been extinct for so long a time as if he had reached extinction today or yesterday because of my possessing the mighty knowledge and sight of the Tathagata. And on that occasion, the Lord pronounced the following stanzas. 1. I remember the great seer, 
Abigna Gna Anabibu, the most high of men, who existed many cotis of aeons ago as the superior Gina of the period. Two, if, for example, some men, after reducing this universe to atoms of dust, took one atom to deposit it a thousand regions farther on, if he deposit a second, a third atom, and so proceeded until he had done with the whole mass of dust, so that this world were empty and the mass of dust exhausted, to that immense mass of the dust of these worlds, entirely reduced to atoms, I liken the number of aeons past. So immense is the number of cotes of aeons past, since that extinct sugata, the whole of existing atoms, is no adequate expression of it. So many are the aeons which have expired since. That leader who has expired so long ago, those disciples and bodhisattvas, I remember all of them as if it were today or yesterday, such is the knowledge of the Tathagatas. So endless monks is the knowledge of the Tathagata. I know what has taken place many hundreds of aeons ago by my precise and faultless memory. To proceed, monks, the measure of the lifetime of the Tathagata, Mahabhigna Gana Ana Bibu, the Arhat, was 5,400,000 myriads of Kotis of Aeons. In the beginning, when the Lord had not yet reached supreme, perfect enlightenment, and had just occupied the summit of the Terrace of Enlightenment, he discomfited and defeated the whole host of Mara, after which he thought, I am to reach perfect enlightenment. But those laws had not yet dawned upon him. He stayed on the terrace of enlightenment at the foot of the tree of enlightenment during one intermediate kalpa. He stayed there a second, a third intermediate kalpa, but did not yet attain supreme perfect enlightenment. He remained a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh, an eighth, a ninth, a tenth intermediate kalpa on the terrace of enlightenment at the foot of the tree of enlightenment, continuing sitting cross-legged without in the meanwhile rising. He stayed, the mind motionless, the body unstirring and untrembling, but those laws had not yet dawned upon him. Now, monks, while the Lord was just on the summit of the Terrace of Enlightenment, the gods of paradise, Triya Strima Sas, prepared him a magnificent royal throne, a hundred yoganas high, on occupying which the Lord attained supreme perfect enlightenment. And no sooner had the Lord occupied the seat of enlightenment than the Brahma Kayika gods scattered a rain of flowers all around the sea of enlightenment over a distance of a hundred yoganas. In the sky they let loose storms by which the flowers withered were swept away. From the beginning of the rain of flowers, while the Lord was sitting on the seat of enlightenment, it poured without interruption during fully ten intermediate kalpas covering the Lord. That rain of flowers, having once begun falling, continued to the moment of the Lord's complete nirvana. The angels belonging to the division of the four guardians of the cardinal points made the celestial drums of the gods resound. They made them resound without interruption in honor of the Lord who had attained the summit of the Terrace of Enlightenment. Thereafter, during fully ten intermediate kalpas, they made uninterruptedly resound those celestial musical instruments up to the moment of the complete extinction of the Lord. Again, monks, after the lapse of ten intermediate kalpas, the Lord, Maha Bhigna Gna Anabibu, the Tathagata, reached supreme perfect enlightenment. Immediately on knowing his having become enlightened, the sixteen sons born to that Lord when a prince royal the eldest of whom was named Gananakara, which sixteen young princes, monks, had severally toys to play with, variegated and pretty. Those sixteen princes, I repeat, monks, left their toys, their amusements, and since they knew 
that the Lord Mahabhigana Anabibu, the Tathagata, had attained supreme perfect knowledge, went surrounded and attended by their weeping mothers and nurses, along with the noble, rich king, Kak Kravartin, many ministers, and hundred thousands of myriads of kotis of living beings, to the place where the Lord Mahabhigana Anabibu, the Tathagata, was seated on the summit of the Terrace of Enlightenment. They went up to the Lord in order to honor, respect, worship, revere, and venerate him, saluted his feet with their heads, made three turns around him, keeping him to the right, lift up their joined hands, and praise the Lord face to face with the following stanzas. 8. Thou art the great physician, having no superior, rendered perfect in endless aeons. Thy benign wish of saving all mortals from darkness has today been fulfilled. 9. Most difficult things hast thou achieved during the ten intermediate kalpas now pass. Thou hast been sitting all that time without once moving thy body, hand, foot, or any other part. 10. Thy mind also was tranquil and steady, motionless, never to be shaken. Thou knewest no distraction, thou art completely quiet and faultless. Joy with thee that thou so happily and safely, without any hurt, hast reached supreme enlightenment. How great a fortune is ours. We congratulate ourselves, O lion amongst kings. 12. These unhappy creatures, vexed in all ways, deprived of eyes, as it were, and joyless, do not find the road leading to the end of toils, nor develop energy for the sake of deliverance. Dangers are for a long time on the increase, and in the laws or phenomena or things are deprived of the possession of a celestial body. The word of the Gina is not being heard. The whole world is plunged in thick darkness. But today, or now, hast thou, majesty of the world, reached this hallowed, high, and faultless spot? We as well as the world are obliged to thee, and approach to seek our refuge with thee, O protector. When, O monks, those sixteen princes in the condition of boys, childlike and young, had with such stanzas celebrated the Lord Mahabhigna Ganana Bibu, the Tathagata, they urged the Lord to move on the wheel of the law. Preach the law, O Lord, preach the law, O Sugata, for the well of the public, the happiness of the public, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit, well, and happiness of the people generally, both of gods and men. And on that occasion they uttered the following stanzas. Preach the law, O thou who art marked with a hundred auspicious signs, O leader, O incomparable great seer. Thou hast attained exalted, sublime knowledge. Let it shine in the world, including the gods. Release us as well as these creatures. Display the knowledge of the Tathagatas that we also and further, these beings may obtain this supreme enlightenment. Thou knowest every course of duty and knowledge. Thou knowest the mental and moral disposition and the good works done in a former state, the natural bent of all living beings. Move on the most exalted sublime wheel. Then monks as the Lord Mahabhigna Ganana Bibu, the Tathagata, reach supreme perfect enlightenment, 50,000 myriads of kotis of spheres in each of the ten directions of space were shaken in six different ways and became illumined with a great luster and in the intervals between all those spheres in the dreary places of dark gloom where even the sun and moon so powerful mighty and splendid have no advantage of the shining power they are endowed with have no advantage of the color and brightness they possess even in those places a great luster arose instantly and the beings who appeared in those intervals behold each other, acknowledge each other, and exclaim, Lo, there are other beings also here appearing. Lo, there are other beings also here appearing. The palaces and aerial cars of the gods in all those spheres up to the Brahma world shook in six different ways and became illumined with a great luster surpassing the divine majesty of the gods. So then, monks, a great earthquake and a great sublime luster arose simultaneously, 
and the aerial cars of the Brahma angels to the east in these 50 hundred thousand myriads of cotis of spheres began excessively to glitter glow and sparkle in splendor and glory and those Brahma angels made this reflection what may be foreboded by these aerial cars so excessively glittering glowing and sparkling in splendor and glory Thereupon, monks, the Brahma angels in the fifty hundred thousand myriads of cotis of spheres, went all to each other's abodes and communicated the matter to one another. After that, monks, the great Brahma angel named Sarvasatvatratri, the savior of all beings, addressed the numerous host of Brahma angels in the following stanzas. Our aerial cars today, or now, are all bristling with rays in an extraordinary degree and blazing in beautiful splendor and brilliancy what may be the cause of it come let us investigate the matter what divine being has today sprung into existence whose power such as was never seen before here now appears stanza 20 or should it be the buddha the king of kings who today has been born somewhere in the world and whose birth is announced by such a token that all the points of the horizon are now blazing in splendor thereupon monks the great Brahma angels in the fifty hundred thousand myriads of cotis of spheres mounted all together their own divine aerial cars took with them divine bags as large as Mount Sumeru with celestial flowers and went through the four quarters successively until they arrived at the western quarter where those great brahma angels o monks stationed in the western quarter saw the lord maha bigana gana ana bibu the tathagata on the summit of the exalted terrace of enlightenment seated on the royal throne at the foot of the tree of enlightenment surrounded and attended by gods nagas Goblins, Gandharvas, demons, Garudas, Kinaras, great serpents, men and beings, not human. While his sons, the sixteen young princes, were urging him to move forward the wheel of the law. On seeing which, the Brahma angels came up to the Lord, saluted his feet with their heads, walked many hundred thousand times round him from left to right, strewing flowers. And overwhelming both him and the tree of enlightenment over a distance of ten yoganas with those flower bags as large as Mount Sumeru after that they presented to the Lord their aerial cars with the words except O Lord these aerial cars out of compassion to us use O Sugata those cars out of compassion to us on that occasion monks after presenting their own cars to the Lord the Brahma angels celebrated the Lord face to face with the following seasonable stanzas. Stanza 21. A wonderful matchless Gina, so beneficial and merciful, has arisen in the world. Thou art born a protector, a ruler and teacher, a master today. All quarters are blessed. We have come as far as fully 50,000 cotis of worlds from here to humbly salute the Gina by surrendering our lofty aerial cars altogether. We possess these variegated and bright cars owing to previous works accept them to oblige us and make use of them to thine heart's content O knower of the world after the great Brahma angels monks had celebrated the Lord Maha Bigna Gana Anabibu the Tathagata face to face with these seasonable stanzas they besought him saying may the Lord move forward the wheel of the law may the Lord preach final rest may the Lord release all beings be favorable, O Lord, to this world. Preach the law, O Lord, to this world, including gods, maras, and Brahma angels, to all people, including ascetics and Brahmins, gods, men, and demons. It will tend to the well of the public, to the happiness of the public, out of mercy to the world for the benefit and happiness of the people at large, both gods and men. Thereupon, monks, those fifty hundred thousand myriads of cotis of Brahma angels address the Lord with one voice in common chorus with the following stanza show the law o lord show it o most high of men show the power of thy kindness save the tormented beings rare is the light of the world 
like the blossom of the glomerated fig tree. Thou hast arisen, O great hero, we pray to thee, the Tathagata, and the Lord, O monks, silently intimated his ascent to the Brahma angels. Somewhat later, amongst the aerial cars of the Brahma angels in the southeastern quarter, and the fifty hundred thousand myriads of spheres began excessively to glitter, glow, and sparkle in splendor and glory. And those Brahma angels made this reflection, what may be foreboded by these aerial cars so excessively glittering, glowing, and sparkling in splendor and glory? Thereupon amongst the Brahma angels and the fifty hundred thousand myriads of kotis of spheres went all to each other's abodes and communicated the matter to one another. After that, monks, the great Brahma angel named Adhima Traka Runika, i.e. exceedingly compassionate, addressed the numerous host of Brahma angels with the following stanzas. What foretoken is it we see today or now, friends? Who or what is foreboded by the celestial cars shining with such uncommon glory? May perhaps some blessed divine being have come hither, by whose power all these aerial cars are illumined. Or may the Buddha, the most high of men, have appeared in this world that by his power these celestial cars are in such a condition as we see them? Let us all together go and search. No trifle can be the cause of it. Such a foretoken indeed was never seen before. Stanza 30. Come, let us go and visit Kotis of Fields. Along the four quarters, a Buddha will certainly how have made his appearance in this world. Thereupon monks, the great Brahma angels, and the fifty hundred thousand myriads of Kotis of spheres mounted all together, their own divine aerial cars, took with them divine bags as large as Mount Sumeru, with celestial flowers and went through the four quarters successively until they arrived at the northwestern quarter where those great Brahma angels stationed in the northwestern quarter saw the Lord Mahabhigna Gana Anabibu as above till compassion to us. On that occasion, monks, after presenting their own cars to the Lord, the Brahma angels celebrated the Lord face to face with the following seasonable stanzas. Homage to thee, matchless great seer, chief god of gods, whose voice is sweet as the larks, leader in the world, including the gods. I salute thee, who art so benign and bounteous to the world. How wonderful, O Lord, is it that after so long a time thou appearest in the world. Eighty hundred complete aeons this world of the living was without Buddha. It was deprived of the most high of men. Hell was prevailing, and the celestial bodies constantly went on waning during eighty hundred complete aeons. But now he has appeared, owing to our good works. Who is our eye, refuge, resting place, protection, father, and kinsman? He, the benign and bounteous one, the king of the law. After the great Brahma angels, monks, had celebrated the Lord Mahabhigna Agana, Bibu, the Tathagata, face to face with these seasonable stanzas, they besought him. May the Lord move forward the wheel of the law as above till both gods and men. Thereupon, monks, those fifty hundred thousand myriads of kotis of Brahma angels address the Lord with one voice in common chorus with the following stanzas. Move forward the exalted wheel, O great ascetic. Reveal the law in all directions. Deliver all beings oppressed with suffering. Produce amongst mortals gladness and joy. Let them by hearing the law partake of enlightenment and reach divine places. Let all shake off their demon body and be peaceful, meek, and at ease. And the Lord, O monks, silently intimated his ascent to these Brahma angels also. Somewhat later, monks, the aerial cars of the Brahma angels in the southern quarter, as above till to one another, after that, monks, the great Brahma angel named Sudharma, Address the numerous hosts of Brahma angels in stanzas. It cannot be without cause or reason, friends, that today or now all these celestial cars are so brilliant. This bespeaks some portent somewhere in the world. Come, let us go and investigate the matter. No such portent has appeared in hundreds of aeons past. Either some god has been born or a Buddha has arisen in this world. 
thereupon monks, the great Brahma angels, and the fifty hundred thousand myriads of cotes of spheres mounted as above till compassion to us. On that occasion, monks, after presenting their own cars to the Lord, the Brahma angels celebrated the Lord face to face with the following seasonable stanzas. Most rare and precious is the sight of the leaders. Be welcome, thou dispeller of worldly defilement. It is after a long time that thou now appearest in the world. After hundreds of complete aeons, one now beholds thee. Stanza 40. Refresh the thirsty creatures, O Lord of the world. Now first thou art seen. It is not easy to behold thee. As rare or precious as the flowers of the agglomerated fig tree is thine appearance, O Lord. By thy power, these aerial cars of ours are so uncommonly illumined now, O leader, to show us thy favor, accept them, O thou whose look pierces everywhere. After the great Brahma angels, monks had celebrated the Lord Mahabhigana Gana Abibu, the Tathagata, face to face with these seasonable stanzas, they besought him, May the Lord move forward the wheel of the law as above till gods and men. <clears throat> Thereupon, monks, those fifty hundred thousand myriads of cotis of Brahma angels addressed the Lord with one voice in common chorus with the following stanzas. Preach the law, O Lord and leader. Move forward the wheel of the law. Make the drum of the law resound and blow the conch trumpet of the law. Shed the rain of the true law over this world and proclaim the sweet sounding good word. Manifest the law required. Save myriads of cotis of beings. And the Lord Monk silently intimated his assent to the Brahma angels. Repetition, the same occurred in the southwest, in the west, in the northwest, in the north, in the northeast, in the nadir. Then, monks, the aerial cars of the Brahma angels in the nadir. In those fifty hundred thousand myriads of cotis of spheres, after that, monks, the great Brahma angel named Sikkin, Address the numerous hosts of Brahma angels with the following stanzas. What may be the cause, O oh friends, that our cars are so bright with splendor, color, and light? What may be the reason of their being so exceedingly glorious? We have seen nothing like this before, nor heard of it from others. These cars are now bright with splendor and exceedingly glorious. What may be the cause of it? Should it be some god who has been bestowed upon the world in recompense of good works and whose grandeur thus comes to light or is perhaps a buddha born in the world thereupon monks the great brahma angels in the fifty hundred thousand myriads of cotis of spheres mounted all together their own divine aerial cars took with them divine bags as large as mount sumeru with celestial flowers and went through the four quarters successively until they arrived at the zenith where those great Brahma angels stationed at the zenith saw the Lord Mahabhigna Agana Bibu. On that occasion, monks, after presenting their own cars to the Lord, the Brahma angels celebrated the Lord face to face with the following seasonable stanzas. How goodly is the sight of the Buddhas, the mighty lords of the world, those Buddhas who are to deliver all beings in this triple world. The all-seeing masters of the world send their looks in all directions of the horizon, and by opening the gate of immortality, they make people reach the safe shore. An inconceivable number of aeons now passed were void, and all quarters wrapped in darkness as the chief Ginas did not appear. Stanza 50. The dreary hells, the brute creation, and demons were on the increase. Thousands of cotis of living beings fell into the state of ghosts. The heavenly bodies were on the wane. After their disappearance, they entered upon evil ways. Their course became wrong because they did not hear the law of the Buddhas. All creatures lack dutiful behavior, purity, good state, and understanding. Their happiness was lost, and the consciousness of happiness was gone. They did not observe the rules of morality, were firmly rooted in the false law, not being led by the Lord of the world. They were precipitated into a false course. Hail, thou art come at last, O light of the world, thou born to be bounteous towards all beings. Hail, thou hast safely arrived at supreme Buddha knowledge. We feel thankful before thee, and so does the world, including the gods. 
By thy power, O mighty Lord, our aerial cars are glittering. To thee we present them, great hero. Deign to accept them, great solitary. Out of grace to us, O leader, make use of them, so that we, as well as all other beings, may attain supreme enlightenment. After the great Brahma angels, O monks, had celebrated the Lord Maha Bhigna Gana Anabibu, the Tathagata face to face with seasonable stanzas, they besought him, may the Lord move forward the wheel of the law. Thereupon, monks, those fifty hundred thousand myriads of kotis of Brahma angels address the Lord with one voice in common chorus with the following two stanzas. Move forward the exalted unsurpassed wheel, beat the drum of immortality, release all beings from hundreds of evils, and show the path of nirvana. Expound the law we pray for, show thy favor to us in this world, let us hear thy sweet and lovely voice, which thou hast exercised during thousands of kotis of aeons. Now amongst the Lord, Maha Bhigna Gana Anabibu, the Tathagata, being acquainted with the prayer of the hundred thousand myriads of kotis of Brahma angels, and of the sixteen princes, his sons, commenced at that juncture to turn the wheel that has three turns and twelve parts, the wheel never moved by any ascetic, Brahmin, God, demon, nor by anyone else. His preaching consisted in this. This is pain. This is the origin of pain. This is the suppression of pain. This is the treatment leading to suppression of pain. He moreover extensively set forth how the series of causes and effects is evolved, and said, It is thus, monks, from ignorance proceed conceptions or fancies. From conceptions or fancies proceeds understanding. From understanding, name and form. From name and form, the six senses. From the six senses proceeds contact. From contact, sensation. From sensation proceeds longing. From longing proceeds striving. From striving as cause issues existence. From existence, birth. From birth, old age, death, mourning, lamentation, sorrow, dismay, and despondency. So originates this whole mass of misery. From the suppression of ignorance results the suppression of conceptions. From the suppression of conceptions results that of understanding. From the suppression of understanding results that of name and form. From the suppression of name and form results that of the six senses. From the suppression of the six senses results that of contact. From the suppression of contact results that of sensation. From the suppression of sensation results that of longing. From the suppression of longing results that of striving. From the suppression of striving results that of existence. From the suppression of existence results that of birth. From the suppression of birth results that of old age, death, mourning, lamentation, sorrow, dismay, and despondency. In this manner the whole mass of misery is suppressed. And while this wheel of the law of monks was being moved onward by the Lord Maha Bhigna Agana Bibu, <clears throat> the Tathagata, in presence of the world, including the gods, demons, and Brahma angels of the assemblage, including ascetics and Brahmins. Then at that time, on that occasion, the minds of sixty hundred thousand myriads of kotis of living beings were without effort freed from imperfections and became all possessed of the triple science of the sixfold transcendent wisdom of the emancipations and meditations. In due course, monks, the Lord, Maha Bhigna Gana Anabibu, the Tathagata, again gave a second exposition of the law, likewise a third and a fourth exposition. And at each exposition, monks, the minds of hundred thousands of myriads of kotis of beings like the sands of the river Ganges were without effort freed from imperfections afterwards. Monks, the congregation of disciples of that Lord was so numerous as to surpass all calculation. Meanwhile, monks, the sixteen princes, the youths, had full of faith, left home to lead the vagrant life of mendicants, and had all of them become novices, clever, bright, intelligent, pious, followers of the course of duty under many hundred thousand Buddhas, and striving after supreme, perfect enlightenment. These sixteen novices, monks, said to the Lord Maha Bhigna Agana Anabibu, the Tathagata, the following, O Lord, these many hundred thousand myriads of kotis of disciples of the Tathagata have become very mighty, very powerful, very potent, owing to the Lord's teaching of the law. Deign, O Lord, to teach us also for mercy's sake the law with a view to supreme perfect enlightenment, so that we also may follow the teaching of the Tathagata. We want, O Lord, to see the knowledge of the Tathagata. 
The Lord can himself testify to this, for thou, O Lord, who knowest the disposition of all beings, also knowest ours. Then monks, on seeing that those princes, the youths, had chosen the vagrant life of mendicants and become novices, the half of the whole retinue of the king Kakrivartan, to the number of eighty hundred thousand myriads of cotes of living beings, chose the vagrant life of mendicants. Subsequently, monks, the Lord Mahabigna, Agna, Nabibu, the Tathagata, viewing the prayer of those novices at the lapse of twenty thousand aeons, amply and completely revealed the Dharma, Par Yaya, called the Lotus of the True Law, a text of great extent, serving to instruct bodhisattvas and proper for all Buddhas, in presence of all the four classes of auditors. In course of time, monks, those sixteen novices grasped, kept, and fully penetrated the Lord's teaching. Subsequently, monks, the Lord Mahabhigna Gana Nanabibu, the Tathagata, foretold those sixteen novices their future destiny to supreme perfect enlightenment. And while the Lord Mahabhigna Gana Nabibu, the Tathagata, was propounding the Dharma Parayaya of the Lotus of the True Law, the disciples, as well as the sixteen novices, were full of faith, and many hundred thousand myriads of cotes of beings acquired perfect certainty. Thereupon, monks, after propounding the Dharma Paryaya of the Lotus of the True Law during eight thousand aeons without interruption, the Lord Mahabhigna Gana Anabibu, the Tathagata, entered the monastery to retire for the purpose of meditation. And in that retirement, monks, the Tathagata continued in the monastery during 84,000 cotes of aeons. Now, monks, when the 16 novices perceived that the Lord was absorbed, they sat down on the seats, the royal thrones, which had been prepared for each of them, and amply expounded during 8,400,000 myriads of cotes, the Dharma Pariyaya of the Lotus of the True Law, to the four classes. By doing this, monks, each of those novices as bodhisattvas fully developed, instructed, excited, stimulated, edified, confirmed in respect to supreme, perfect enlightenment, 60 by 60, 100,000 myriads of kotis of living beings equal to the sands of the river Ganges. Now, monks, at the lapse of 84,000 aeons, the Lord Mahabhigna Agna Anabibu, the Tathagata, rose from his meditation in possession of memory and consciousness, whereafter he went up to the seat of the law designed for him in order to occupy it. As soon as the Lord had occupied the seat of the law, monks, he cast his looks over the whole circle of the audience and addressed the congregation of monks. They are wonderfully gifted, monks. They are prodigiously gifted. These sixteen novices, wise servitors to many hundred thousand myriads of kotis of Buddhas, observers of the course of duty, who have received Buddha knowledge, transmitted Buddha knowledge, expounded Buddha knowledge. Honor these sixteen novices, monks, again and again, and all, be they devoted to the vehicle of the disciples, the vehicle of the Pratyaka Buddhas, or the vehicle of the Bodhisattvas, who shall not reject nor repudiate the preaching of these young men of good family, O monks, shall quickly gain supreme perfect enlightenment and obtain Tathagata knowledge. In the sequel also, monks, have these young men of good family repeatedly revealed this Dharma Paryaya of the Lotus of the True Law under the mastership of that Lord, and the sixty times sixty hundred thousand myriads of kotis of living beings equal to the sands of the river Ganges, who by each of the sixteen novices, the bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, and the quality of bodhisattva had been roused to enlightenment. All those beings followed the example of the sixteen novices in choosing along with them the vagrant life of mendicants in their several existences. They enjoyed their sight and heard the law from their mouth. They propitiated forty kotis of Buddhas, and some are doing so up to this day. I announce to you, monks, I declare to you, those sixteen princes, the youths, who as novices under the mastership of the Lord were interpreters of the law, have all reached supreme, perfect enlightenment, and all of them are staying, existing, living, even now, in the several directions of space, in different Buddha fields, preaching the law to many hundred thousand myriads of kotis of disciples and bodhisattvas to wit, in the East, monks, in the world. 
Abirati, the Tathagata named, Akshovya, the Arhat, and the Tathagata, Merukuta, the Arhat. In the southeast monks is the Tathagata Simhagosha and the Tathagata Simhadvaga. In the south monks is the Tathagata named Akasa Pratishthita and the Tathagata named Nitya Parinirvita. In the southwest monks is the Tathagata named Indra Devaga and the Tathagata named Brahmad. Vaga. In the West, monks is the Tathagata named Amitayas and the Tathagata named Sarva Loka Datu Pa Dravod Vega Pratyutirna. In the Northwest, monks is the Tathagata named Tama La Patra Kanda Naganda Bigna and the Tathagata Merukalpa. In the North, monks is the Tathagata named Meghasvara Pradipa and the Tathagata named Meghasvara Raga in the Northeast monks is the Tathagata named Sarvaloka Bayagitaka Hambitatava Vidafam Sanakara the Arhat and the 16th myself Sakyamuni the Tathagata the Arhat, who have attained supreme perfect enlightenment in the center of this Saha world. Further, monks, those beings who have heard the law from us when we were novices, those many hundred thousand myriads of cotis of beings, numerous as the sands of the river Ganges, whom we have severally initiated in supreme perfect enlightenment, they are up to this day standing at the stage of disciples and matured for supreme perfect enlightenment. In regular turn, they are to attain supreme perfect enlightenment, for it is difficult monks to penetrate the knowledge of the Tathagatas. And which are those beings, monks, who innumerable and calculable, like the sands of the Ganges, those hundred thousands of myriads of cotis of living beings, whom I, when I was a bodhisattva, under the mastership of that Lord, have taught the law of omniscience. Yourselves, monks, were at that time those beings. And those who shall be my disciples in future, when I shall have attained complete nirvana, shall learn the course of duty of bodhisattvas without conceiving the idea of their being. Bodhisattvas and monks, all who shall have the idea of complete nirvana, shall reach it. It should be added, monks, as I stay under different names in other worlds, they shall there be born again seeking after the knowledge of the Tathagatas. And there they shall anew... Hear this dogma. The complete nirvana of the Tathagatas is but one. There is no other, no second nirvana of the Tathagatas. Herein, monks, one has to see a device of the Tathagatas in a direction for the preaching of the law. When the Tathagata monks knows that the moment of his complete extinction has arrived and sees that the assemblage is pure, strong in faith, penetrated with the law of voidness, Devoted to meditation, devoted to great meditation, then, monks, the Tathagata, because the time has arrived, calls together all bodhisattvas and all disciples to teach them thus. There is, O monks, in this world no second vehicle at all, no second nirvana, far less a third. It is an able device of the Tathagata monks that on seeing creatures far advanced in the path of perdition, delighting in the low and plunged, in the mud of sensual desires, the Tathagata teaches them that nirvana to which they are attached. By way of example, monks, suppose there is some dense forest, 500 yoganas in extent, which has been reached by a great company of men. They have a guide to lead them on their journey to the Isle of Jewels, which guide, being able, clever, sagacious, well acquainted with the difficult passages of the forest, is to bring the whole company out of the forest. Meanwhile, that great troop of men, tired, weary, afraid, and anxious, say, Verily, master, guide, and leader, know that we are tired, of weary, afraid, and anxious. Let us return. This dense forest stretches so far. The guide, who is a man of able devices, on seeing those people desirous of returning, thinks within himself. 
It ought not to be that these poor creatures should not reach that great isle of jewels. Therefore, out of pity for them, he makes use of an artifice. In the middle of that forest, he produces a magic city more than a hundred or two hundred yoganas in extent. Thereafter, he says to those men, Be not afraid, sirs, do not return. There you see a populous place where you may take repose and perform all you have to do. There, stay in the enjoyment of happy rest. Let him who, after reposing there, wants to do so, proceed to the great Isle of Jewels. Then monks, the men who are in the forest, are struck with astonishment and think, We are out of the forest. We have reached a place of happy rest. Let us stay here. They enter that magic city in the meaning that they have arrived at the place of their destination, that they are saved and in the enjoyment of rest. They think, we are at rest, we are refreshed. After a while, when the guide perceives that their fatigue is gone, he causes the magic city to disappear and says to them, Come, sirs, there you see the great Isle of Jewels quite near, as this great city. It has been produced by me for no other purpose but to give you some repose. In the same manner, monks, is the Tathagata, the Arhat, your guide and the guide of all other beings. Indeed, monks, the Tathagata reflects thus. Great is this forest of evils which must be crossed, left, shunned. It ought not to be that these beings, after hearing the Buddha knowledge, should suddenly turn back and not proceed to the end, because they think this Buddha knowledge is attended with too many difficulties to be gone through to the end. Under those circumstances, the Tathagata, knowing the creatures to be feeble of character, does as the guide who produces the magic city in order that those people may have repose and after their having taken repose he tells them that the city is one produced by magic in the same manner monks the Tathagata to give a repose to the creatures very skillfully teaches and proclaims two stages of Nirvana the stage of the disciples and that of the Pratye Ka Buddhas and monks when the creatures are there halting then the Tathagata himself pronounces these words, You have not accomplished your task, monks. You have not finished what you had to do. But behold, monks, the Buddha knowledge is near. Behold and be convinced. What to you seems nirvana that is not nirvana? Nay, monks, it is an able device of the Tathagatas that they expound three vehicles. And in order to explain the same subject more in detail, the Lord on that occasion uttered the following stanzas. 60. The leader of the world, Abhigna Gana Anabibu, having occupied the terrace of enlightenment, continued ten complete intermediate kalpas without gaining enlightenment, though he saw the things in their very essence. Then the gods, nagas, demons, and goblins, zealous to honor the Gina, sent down a rain of flowers on the spot where the leader awakened to enlightenment. And high in the sky they beat the symbols to worship and honor the Gina. And they were vexed that the Gina delayed so long in coming to the highest place. After the lapse of ten intermediate kalpas, the Lord Anabibu attained enlightenment. Then all gods, men, serpents, and demons were glad and overjoyed. The sixteen sons of the leader of men, those heroes, being at the time young princes, rich in virtues, came along with thousands of coatees of living beings to honor the eminent chiefs of men. And after saluting the feet of the leader, they prayed, Reveal the law and refresh us, as well as this world, with thy good word, O lion amongst kings. After a long time thou art seen again in the ten points of this world, thou appearest great leader, while the aerial cars of the Brahma angels are stirring to reveal a token to living beings. In the eastern quarter, 50,000 kotis of fields have been shaken, and lofty angelic cars in them have become excessively brilliant. The Brahma angels, on perceiving this foretoken, went and approached the chief of the leaders of the world, and covering him with flowers, presented all of them their cars to him. They prayed him to move forward the wheel of the law, and celebrated him with stanzas and songs. But the king of kings was silent. For he thought, the time has not yet arrived for me to proclaim the law. 70. Likewise in the south, west, north, the nadir, 
zenith and in the intermediate points of the compass there were thousands of kotis of brahma angels unremittingly covering the lord with flowers they saluted the feet of the leader presented all their aerial cars celebrated him and again prayed move forward the wheel o thou whose sight is infinite rarely art thou met in the course of many kotis of aeons display the benevolence thou hast observed in so many former generations open the gate of immortality on hearing their prayer he whose sight is infinite exposed the multifarious law and the four truths extensively all existences spring successively from their antecedents starting from ignorance the seer proceeded to speak of death endless woe all those evils spring from birth no likewise that death is the lot of mankind no sooner had he expounded the multifarious different endless laws than 80 myriads of coties of creatures who had heard them quickly attain the stage of disciples on a second occasion the gina expounded many laws and beings like the sands of the ganges became instantly purified and disciples from that moment the assembly of that leader of the world was innumerable no man would be able to reach the term of its number even were he to go on counting for myriads of cotes of aeons those 16 princes also his own dear sons who had become mendicants and novices said to the gina expound o chief the superior law that we may become sages knowers of the world such as thyself art o supreme of all genus and that all these beings may become such as thyself art o hero o clear-sighted one stanza 80 and the gina considering the wish of his sons the young princes explained the highest superior enlightenment by means of many myriads of cotes of illustrations demonstrating with thousands of arguments and elucidating the knowledge of transcendent wisdom the lord of the world indicated the veritable course of duty such as was followed by the wise bodhisattvas this very sutra of great extension this good lotus of the true law was by the lord delivered in many thousands of stanzas so numerous as to equal the sands of the ganges after delivering the sutra the gina entered the monastery for the purpose of becoming absorbed in meditation during 84 complete aeons the lord of the world continued meditating sitting on the same seat those novices perceiving that the chief remained in the monastery without coming out of it imparted to many cotes of creatures that buddha knowledge which is free from imperfections and blissful on the seats which they had made to be prepared one for each they expounded this very sutra under the mastership of the sugata of that period a service of the same kind they rendered to me innumerable as the sands of sixty thousand rivers like the ganges were the beings then taught each of the sons of the sugata converted or trained endless beings after the Gina's complete nirvana, they commenced a wandering life and saw Kotis of Buddhas. Along with those peoples, they rendered homage to the most exalted amongst men. Having observed the extensive and sublime course of duty and reached enlightenment in the ten points of space, those sixteen sons of the Gina became themselves Ginas, two by two in each point of the horizon. And all those who had been their pupils became disciples of those Ginas and gradually obtained possession of enlightenment by various means. I myself was one of their number, and you have all been taught by me. Therefore, you are my disciples now also, and I lead you all to enlightenment by my disciples. This is the cause dating from old. This is the motive of my expounding the law, that I lead you to superior enlightenment. This being the case, monks, you need not be afraid. It is as if there were a forest, dreadful, terrific, barren, without a place of refuge or shelter, replete with wild beasts, deprived of water, frightful for persons of no experience. Suppose further that many thousand men have come to the forest, that waste tract of wilderness, which is fully 500 yoganas in extent. 
and he who is to act as their God through that rough and horrible forest is a rich man, thoughtful, intelligent, wise, well-instructed, and undaunted. And those beings, numbering many kotis, feel tired and say to the God, We are tired, Master. We are not able to go on. We should like now to return. But he, the dexterous and clever guide, is searching in his mind for some apt device. Alas, he thinks, by going back, these foolish men will be deprived of the possession of the jewels. Therefore, let me, by dint of magic power, now produce a great city adorned with thousands of coatees of buildings and embellished by monasteries and parks. Let me produce ponds and canals, a city adorned with gardens and flowers, provided with walls and gates, and inhabited by an infinite number of men and women. 99. After creating that city, he speaks to them in this manner. Do not fear and be cheerful. You have reached a most excellent city. Enter it and do your business speedily. Stanza 100. Be joyful and at ease. You have reached the limit of the whole forest. It is to give them a time for repose. That he speaks these words and in fact they recover from their weariness. As he perceives that they have sufficiently reposed, he collects them and dresses them again. Come hear what I have to tell you. This city have I produced by magic. On seeing you fatigued, I have, lest you should go back, made use of this device. Now strain your energy to reach the isle. In the same manner, monks, I am the guide, the conductor of thousands of coatees of living beings. In the same manner, I see creatures toiling and unable to break the shell of the egg of evils. Then I reflect on this matter. These beings have enjoyed repose, have been tranquilized. Now I will remind them of the misery of all things, and I say, At the stage of Arhat you shall reach your aim. At that time when you shall have attained that state, and when I see all of you have become Arhats, then will I call you all together and explain to you how the law really is. It is an artifice of the leaders, when they, the great seers, show three vehicles, for there is but one vehicle, no second. It is only to help creatures that two vehicles are spoken of. Therefore, I now tell you, monks, rouse to the utmost your lofty energy for the sake of the knowledge of the all-knowing. As yet, you have not come so far as to possess complete nirvana. But when you shall have attained the knowledge of the all-knowing and the ten powers proper to Ginas, you shall become Buddhas marked by the thirty-two characteristic signs and have rest forever. Such is the teaching of the leaders. In order to give quiet, they speak of repose. But when they see that the creatures have had a repose, they, knowing this, to be no final resting place, initiate them in the knowledge of the all-knowing. Chapter 8. Announcement of the future destiny of the 500 monks. On hearing from the Lord that display of skillfulness, and the instruction by means of mysterious speech. On hearing the announcement of the future destiny of the great disciples, as well as the foregoing tale concerning ancient devotion and the leadership of the Lord, the Venerable Purna, son of Maitrayani, was filled with wonder and amazement, thrilled with pure-heartedness, a feeling of delight and joy. He rose from his seat, full of delight and joy, full of great respect for the law, and while prostrating himself before the Lord's feet, made within himself the following reflection. Wonderful, O Lord, wonderful, O Shugata, it is an extremely difficult thing that the Tathagatas perform the conforming to this world composed of so many elements and preaching the law to all creatures with many proofs of their skillfulness and skillfully releasing them when attached to this or that. What could we do, O Lord, in such a case? None but the Tathagata knows our inclination and our ancient course. Then, after 
saluting with his head the Lord's feet, Perna went and stood apart, gazing up to the Lord with unmoved eyes and so showing his veneration. And the Lord, regarding the mental disposition of the venerable Perna, son of Matriani, addressed the entire assembly of monks in this strain, Ye monks, see this disciple Perna, son of Matriani, whom I have designated as the foremost of preachers in this assembly, praised for his many virtues, and who has applied himself in various ways to comprehend the true law. He is the man to excite, arouse, and stimulate the four classes of the audience, unwearied in the preaching of the law, as capable to preach the law as to oblige his fellow followers of the course of duty. The Tathagata accepted, monks, there is none able to equal Purna, son of Maitra Yani, either essentially or in accessories. Now, monks, do you suppose that he keeps my true law only? No, monks, you must not think so, for I remember, monks, that in the past, in the times of the 99 Buddhas, the same Purna kept the true law under the mastership of those Buddhas. Even as he is now with me, so he has in all periods been the foremost of the preachers of the law has in all periods been a consummate knower of voidness, has in all periods acquired the four distinctive qualifications of an arhat, has in all periods reached mastership in the transcendent wisdom of the bodhisattvas. He has been a strongly convinced preacher of the law, exempt from doubt and quite pure. Under the mastership of those Buddhas, he has during his whole existence observed a spiritual life, and everywhere they termed him the disciple. By this means he has promoted the interest of innumerable, incalculable, hundred, thousands of myriads of cotis of beings, and brought innumerable and incalculable beings to full ripeness for supreme and perfect enlightenment. In all periods he has assisted the creatures in the function of a Buddha and in all periods he has purified his own Buddha field always striving to bring creatures to ripeness he was also amongst the foremost among the preachers of the law under the seven Tathagatas the first of whom is Vipassian and the seventh myself and as to the Buddhas, monks, who have in future to appear in this Bhadra Kalpa, to the number of a thousand to less four, under the mastership of them also shall the same Purna, son of Maitrayani, be the foremost among the preachers of the law and the keeper of the true law. Thus, he shall keep the true law of innumerable and incalculable lords and Buddhas in future promote the interests of innumerable and incalculable beings and bring innumerable and incalculable beings to full ripeness for supreme and perfect enlightenment. Constantly and assiduously, he shall be instant in purifying his own Buddha field and bringing creatures to ripeness. After completing such a bodhisattva course, at the end of innumerable incalculable aeons, he shall reach supreme and perfect enlightenment. He shall in the world be a Tathagata called Dharma, Prabhasa, an Arhat, endowed with science and conduct, a Sugata. He shall appear in this very Buddha field. Further monks at that time. The Buddha field spoken of will look as if formed by thousands of spheres similar to the sands of the river Ganges. It will be even like the palm of the hand consists of seven precious substances, be without hills and filled with high edifices of seven precious substances. There will be cars of the gods stationed in the sky. The gods will behold men and men will behold the gods. 
Moreover, monks, at that time, that Buddha field shall be exempt from places of punishment and from womankind, as all beings shall be born by apparitional birth. They shall lead a spiritual life, have ideal bodies, be self-lighting, magical, moving in the firmament, strenuous, of good memory, wise, possessed of gold-colored bodies, and adorned with the 32 characteristics of a great man. And at that time, monks, the beings in that Buddha field will have two things to feed upon, the delight in the law and the delight in meditation. There will be an immense incalculable number of hundred thousands of myriads of kotis of bodhisattvas, all endowed with great transcendent wisdom accomplished in the four distinctive qualifications of an arhat, able in instructing creatures. He will have a number of disciples beyond all calculation, mighty in magic, powerful, masters in the meditation of the eight emancipations. So immense are the good qualities that Buddha field will be possessed of. And that aeon shall be called Ratnavabhasa, radiant with gems. And that world, Suvasuda, very pure. His lifetime shall last immense incalculable aeons. And after the complete extinction of that Lord Dharma, Prabhasa, the Tathagata, his true law shall last long and his world shall be full of stupas made of precious substances. Such inconceivable good qualities monks shall the Buddha field of that Lord be possessed of. So spoke the Lord and thereafter he, the Sugata, the master, added the following stanzas. Stanza one. Listen to me monks and hear how. My son has achieved his course of duty, and how he, well trained and skillful, has observed the course of enlightenment. 2. Viewing these beings to be lowly disposed and to be startled at the lofty vehicle, the bodhisattvas become disciples and exercise pratyaka buddhaship. 3. By many hundreds of able devices, they bring numerous bodhisattvas to full ripeness and declare. We are but disciples indeed, and we are far away from the highest and supreme enlightenment. It is by learning from them this course of duty that cotees of beings arrive at full ripeness, who at first, lowly disposed and somewhat lazy, in course of time all become Buddhas. They follow a course in ignorance, thinking, We disciples are of little use indeed. In despondency, they descend into all places of existence and clear their own field. They show in their own persons that they are not free from affection, hatred, and infatuation, and on perceiving other beings clinging to heretical views, they go so far as to accommodate themselves to those views. By following such a course, my numerous disciples skillfully save creatures. Simple people would go mad if they were taught the whole course of life or story. Purna here, monks, my disciple, has formally fulfilled his course of duty under thousands of kotis of Buddhas. He has got possession of this true law by seeking after Buddha knowledge. And at all periods, he has been the foremost of the disciples, learned, a brilliant orator, Free from hesitation, he has indeed always been able to excite to gladness and at all times ready to perform the Buddha task. Stanza 10. He has always been accomplished in the sublime transcendent faculties and endowed with the distinctive qualifications of an arhat. He knew the faculties and range of other beings and has always preached the perfectly pure law. By exposing the most eminent of true laws, he has brought thousands of cotees of beings to full ripeness for this supreme foremost vehicle, whilst purifying his own excellent field. 12. In future, also, he shall likewise honor thousands of cotees of Buddhas, acquire knowledge of the most eminent of good laws, and clean his own field, always free from timidity, 
He shall preach the law with thousands of coatees of able devices and bring many beings to full ripeness for the knowledge of the all-knowing that is free from imperfections. After having paid homage to the chiefs of men and always kept the most eminent of laws, he shall in the world be a Buddha self-born, widely renowned everywhere by the name of Dharma Prabhasa. And his field shall always be very pure and always set off with seven precious substances. His aeon shall be called Ratna Vabasa and his world Suvisuddha. That world shall be pervaded with many thousand kotis of bodhisattvas accomplished masters in the great transcendent sciences, pure in every respect and endowed with magical power. At that period, the chief shall also have an assemblage of thousands of kotis of disciples endowed with magical power, adepts at the meditation of the eight emancipations and accomplished in the four distinctive qualifications of an arhat. And all beings in that Buddha field shall be pure and lead a spiritual life, springing into existence by apparitional birth. They shall all be gold-colored and display the 32 characteristic signs. They shall know no other food but pleasure in the law and delight in knowledge. No womankind shall be there, nor fear of the places of punishments or of dismal states. Stanza 20. Such shall be the excellent field of Purna, who is possessed of all good qualities. It shall abound with all goodly things, a small part only of which has here been mentioned. Then this thought arose in the mind of those 1,200 self-controlled arhats. We are struck with wonder and amazement. How, if the Tathagata would predict to us severally our future destiny as the Lord has done to those other great disciples? And the Lord apprehending in his own mind what was going on in the minds of these great disciples addressed the venerable Maha Kasyapa. Those 1,200 self-controlled hearers whom I am now beholding from face to face to all those 1,200 self-controlled hearers, Kasyapa, I will presently foretell their destiny. Amongst them, Kasyapa, the monk Kaundinya, a great disciple, shall, after 6,200,000 myriads of kotis of Buddhas, become a Tathagata, an arhat under the name of Samanta Prabhasa, endowed with science and conduct, a Sugata, but of those 1,200 Kasyapa, 500 shall become Tathagatas of the same name. Thereafter shall all those 500 great disciples reach supreme and perfect enlightenment, all bearing the name of Samanta Prabhasa, Gaya Kasyapa, Nadi Kasyapa, Uru Vilva, Kasyapa, Kala, Kalodayan, Aniruddha, Kavhina, Fakula, Kunda, Svagata, and the rest of the 500 self-controlled arhats. And on that occasion, the Lord uttered the following stanzas. 21. The scion of the Kundina family, my disciple here, shall in future be a Tathagata, a lord of the world after the lapse of an endless period he shall educate hundreds of coties of living beings after seeing many endless buddhas he shall in future after the lapse of an endless period become the gina samanta prabhasa whose field shall be thoroughly pure brilliant gifted with the powers of a buddha with a voice far resounding in all quarters Waited upon by thousands of kotis of beings, he shall preach supreme and eminent enlightenment. There shall be most zealous bodhisattvas mounted on lofty aerial cars and moving, meditative, pure in morals, and assiduous in doing good. After hearing the law from the highest of men, they shall invariably go to other fields to salute thousands of Buddhas and show them great honor. But ere long they shall return to the field of the leader called Prabhasa, the Tathagata. So great shall be the power of their course of duty. 
The measure of the lifetime of that Sugata shall be 60,000 aeons, and after the complete extinction of that mighty one, his true law shall remain twice as long in the world, and the counterfeit of it shall continue three times as long, when the true law of that holy one shall be exhausted. Men and gods shall be vexed. There shall appear a complete number of five hundred chiefs, supreme amongst men, who shall bear the same name with that Gina, Samanta Prabha, and follow one another in regular succession. Stanza 30. All shall have like divisions, magical powers, Buddha fields, and hosts of followers. Their true law also shall be the same and stand equally long. Also have in this world, including the gods, the same voice as Samanta Prabhasa, the highest of men, such as I have mentioned before. Moved by benevolence and compassion, they shall in succession foretell each other's destiny with the words. This is to be my immediate successor, and he is to command the world as I do at present. Thus, Kasyapa. Keep now in view here these self-controlled arhats, no less than five hundred in number, as well as my other disciples, and speak of this matter to the other disciples. On hearing from the Lord the announcement of their own future destiny, the five hundred arhats, contented, satisfied in high spirits and ecstasy, filled with cheerfulness, joy, and delight, went up to the place where the Lord was sitting reverentially saluted with their heads his feet and spoke thus we confess our fault o lord in having continually and constantly persuaded ourselves that we had arrived at final nirvana as persons who are dull inept ignorant of the rules for o lord whereas we should have thoroughly penetrated the knowledge of the tathagatas we were content with such a trifling degree of knowledge it is, O Lord, as if some man, having come to a friend's house, got drunk or fell asleep, and that friend bound a priceless gem within his garment with the thought, Let this gem be his. After a while, O Lord, that man rises from his seat and travels further. He goes to some other country where he is befallen by incessant difficulties and has great trouble to find food and clothing. By dint of great exertion, he is hardly able to obtain a bit of food with which, however, he is contented and satisfied. The old friend of that man, O Lord, who bound within the man's garment, that priceless gem, happens to see him again and says, How is it, good friend, that thou hast such difficulty in seeking food and clothing? While I, in order that thou shouldest live in ease, good friend, have bound within thy garment a priceless gem, quite sufficient to fulfill all thy wishes. I have given thee that gem, my good friend, the very gem I have bound within thy garment. Still thou art deliberating what has been bound, by whom, for what reason and purpose. It is something foolish, my good friend, to be contented when thou hast with so much difficulty to procure food and clothing. Go, my good friend, betake thyself with this gem to some great city. Exchange the gem for money. And with that money do all that can be done with money. In the same manner, O Lord, has the Tathagata formerly, when he still followed the course of duty of a Bodhisattva, raised in us also ideas of omniscience, but we, O Lord, did not perceive nor know it. We fancied, O Lord, that on this stage of our hot we had reached nirvana. We live in difficulty, O Lord, because we content ourselves with such a trifling degree of knowledge. But as our strong aspiration after the knowledge of the all-knowing has never ceased, the Tathagata teaches us the right. Have no such idea of nirvana, monks. There are in your intelligence roots of goodness which of your I have fully developed. In this you have to see an able device of mine that from the expressions used by me in preaching the law you fancy nirvana to take place at this moment. And after having taught us the right in such a way, the Lord now predicts our future destiny su to supreme and perfect knowledge. And on that occasion, the 500 self-controlled arhats, Agnata, Kaundinya, and the rest, 
uttered the following stanzas. 34. We are rejoicing and delighted to hear this unsurpassed word of comfort that we are destined to the highest supreme enlightenment. Homage be to thee, O Lord of unlimited sight. We confess our fault before thee. We were so childish, nescient, ignorant that we were fully contented with a small part of nirvana under the mastership of the Sugata. This is a case like that of a certain man who enters the house of a friend, which friend, being rich and wealthy, gives him much food, both hard and soft. After satiating him with nourishment, he gives him a jewel of great value. He ties it with a knot within the upper robe and feels satisfaction at having given that jewel. The other man, unaware of it, goes forth and from that place travels to another town. There he is befallen with misfortune and, as a miserable beggar, seeks his food in affliction. He is contented with the pittance he gets by begging without caring for dainty food. As to that jewel, he has forgotten it. He has not the slightest remembrance of its having been tied in his upper robe. Stanza 40. Under these circumstances, he is seen by his old friend who at home gave him that jewel. This friend properly reprimands him and shows him the jewel within his robe. At this sight, the man feels extremely happy. The value of the jewel is such that he becomes a very rich man of great power and in possession of all that the five senses can enjoy. In the same manner, O Lord, we were unaware of our former aspiration, the aspiration laid in us by the Tathagata himself in previous existences from time immemorial. And we were living in this world, O Lord, with dull understanding and in ignorance under the mastership of the Sugata, for we were contented with a little of nirvana. We required nothing higher, nor even cared for it. But the friend of the world has taught us better. This is no blessed rest at all. The full knowledge of the highest men. That is blessed rest. That is supreme beatitude. After hearing this sublime, grand, splendid, and matchless prediction, O Lord, we are greatly elated with joy when thinking of the prediction we shall have to make to each other in regular succession.